Hello everyone and welcome to our very special 100th episode. We are live in the Giant Brain HQ with some special guests and some of our lovely community as an audience. You're going to witness firsthand exactly how ramshackle Jamie and I are still after all these years. Not everything the live audience hears tonight will make its way into the main cast or even the extended cast that our lovely patrons get to hear. A couple of pieces of business before we get to the cast proper. We are of course recording everything through the Craig bot that's in the audience. We're going to be covering the latest news as usual, followed by a Q&A with the team that will be conducted by our good friend Richard from We're Not Wizards, who is up on stage with us. Hello. Hello, Richard. Hello. Before we go any further, it's my great pleasure to welcome back to the cast, after numerous interdimensional travels, the one and only Sam Mags. Sam's back! It's me! It's Sam! How are you doing, Sam? Hello, I'm very good, thank you very much. I've enjoyed everything so far. It's taken a very different direction, and apparently we're not going in that direction, which is a shame. But I'm here for board games, so let, let's go. Yeah, the, the, the soup cast is for another th- another thing altogether. But we'll we'll talk about that afterwards. You know, maybe you and I can start soup cast and, mm. and and get that sorted out. You, you hearing I, this, Richard? You hearing this? I, I you know, yeah, episode one hundred. Yeah, splitters. <laughs> I'm just not. I just you know. I'm just gonna you know. I'm I'm tempted to go. Anyway, you know who everyone else is. I am, of course, Ian McAllister. I'm Jamie, Jamie Adams. Adams. There you go. <laughs> Jamie. I'm <laughs> He's up to his face in fish. <laughs> I'm up to my face in soup and fish cakes. <laughs> and this is Brainwaves episode 100, bringing you the best in tabletop gaming news. These are the headlines for the week of the 13th of June, 2022. Dungeons and Dragons power couple comes under fire. We will not have our cake and eat it. And Asmodee gets funds from a controversial source. All this and more on this episode of Brainwaves. And of course, it falls to me to do this thing. <laughs> do James have, Stone and Satine. Do you in, do, in, do incidental music then? Do we do a... Do, 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 there is incidental yeah. music, but uh, Ian sticks it on in post. Oh, just, yeah. I've never, I've never figured out how to like do it in a live recording. I'd like to because that'd be kind of interesting. There'll be but ways. There'll be ways. There'll be ways. Sa- sa- I'm not... I'm, I'm not, I'm not sure if there'd be ways to do it through Discord, but yeah, there's definitely ways to do it. I, I need to look into that at like some point. A stream deck or something. More, I think yeah, lack, something like lack of commitment here, this is what I'm detecting. But anyway, you were saying... <laughs> it's 100 episodes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm inviting you onto this cast to be judged. You're not here to, like, you know, assess the podcast. Oh, you know, I, didn't get the, I don't remember getting the rules document. I'm looking at the document just now. It doesn't say anything at all about any of my conduct and how it should be because there's enough people doing dodgy conduct at the moment, isn't there, Ian? There is indeed, Richard. Jameson Stone and Satine Phoenix are the power couple of the Dungeons & Dragons scene. The couple established Apotheosis Studios to put out some of their role-playing work and are involved in seminars across the globe and various other ventures stemming from their actual play series. Just yesterday, we are recording on Friday the 10th of June, a Twitter account called at Nerdy Tatour released details of his experience providing tattoos for Jameson and Satine. This is the account of a tattoo artist called Chad Rowe, who is very sought after as an artist, and I'm going to summarise the thread as best I can, but we will provide links to all of the originals in the show notes. Chad shared messages between himself and Jameson about a contract related to the tattoos. This had come about as they had been flown out by Jameson and Satine to spend three days tattooing the couple. No contracts had been mentioned in the original commission of the tattoos. During the time they spent with the couple, Chad mentioned a contract he had entered into with another commission to protect the uniqueness of that particular tattoo. Jameson showed some interest in this at the time of the work. After completion of the work on Jameson and Satine, a conversation about contracts took place, and the conversation from Jameson's end was less than cordial. During the exchange, Chad sends over a copy of the contract he had mentioned in their chats at the couple's home. Upon receiving this, Jameson can only be described as to go off on one. Those are my words, not anyone else's. He calls Chad unprofessional several times and repeatedly belittles his efforts to sort out what they want from the contract. Chad says in the thread that no contract was asked for up front and goes on to share the exchanges between himself, Jameson and Satine that can only be described as incredibly condescending. This thread has sparked a couple of others detailing their experiences with the couple. A Twitter user called Tristan at the Trisket recounted the experience of he and his partner working with the couple at a convention. 
Tristan and his partner Katie had hired the couple to be on their stream at PAX West as they went around and interviewed folk on the show floor. What transpired was that Tristan and Katie were basically treated like Satine and Jameson's assistants, belittled constantly, talked down to and made to feel awful. I won't detail everything as it is a long thread, but at one point they mentioned being insulted because they had given Satine and Jameson the wrong snacks, snacks that Satine and Jameson had themselves given the couple to carry. Jason Azevedo, involved with some actual play series the couple had been involved with, also listed abuses he had witnessed firsthand, some between Jameson and Satine, some between the couple and others. And there are many more, we are sure. After all this had come out, Jameson posted an apology to Chad on his Facebook profile, which claims he had a hard upbringing, has been diagnosed with complex post-traumatic stress disorder, that is a real thing, I went and looked it up, it goes on to mention that they are in couples counselling, that he is ashamed he let his trauma and disorder cause him to lash out at Chad and Satine, and thanks Chad for holding him accountable. This is pretty fresh breaking news, so we haven't had a chance to reach out for comment for any of the parties involved, and as I mentioned above, we'll link to all the Twitter threads where these abuses are detailed, and uh, Jameson's apology post as well. I've had a bigger read into what's been going on behind the scenes, uh, I saw some replies to the apology saying that Jameson was exhibiting the same behaviour he's apologising for as recently as last week. And it seems to me like this kind of abuse behind the scenes has been going on for a good while. There's a few people who have come out of the work saying, yeah, my experience with this couple is terrible. People haven't spoken up for fear of repercussions. And in some of the threads, Jameson makes those threats explicit due to their sort of power within the Dungeons and Dragons community. They are powerful names in the industry, that's undeniable. And as far as I'm concerned, they should never work again because their abuses seem to be absolutely terrible. Origins are hosting them right now because Origins is going on. Uh, several of their panels have been cancelled, as um, is my understanding, but Satine is still posting video and things like that from the fair. Yeah, awful people being awful. Anybody got any comments on this? I think it comes down to people no matter where they feel they're going to be coming from is kind of like if they feel they have to say something is to speak up because as it seems to be proven again and again and again whether you go back through like the tabletop industry itself having some you know pretty bad actors is that you get one person kind of stepping forward and going this person's been horrific to me and then out of the woodwork there's another five or six people that all come out and go yeah, they, yeah, they yeah, are. They're absolutely time, right? terrible. Yeah. But I think the other thing is as well, is this also comes down to the thing is how many other people have kind of looked on this and known that they've been terrible people but have also done kind of very little about it. Because there's bound to be people that come out and go, oh, yeah, I saw them do this, but I never said anything yeah. kind of thing because of the power. So um, I don't know. It's it seems, to, it seems to happen again and again and again, but it seems to be... Um, it's, it's, certain types of people and the way they kind of gain success um, usually do it on the backs of others and I think once you find that's a route to success it's very very easy to maintain that type of attitude uh, it's very very easy to maintain that kind of modus operandi and belittle other people and push down on people you see it in all, all walks of business as well it's just a question of you know in this kind of space where we've not you've not got like the big human resources department it's, it's almost on the unfortunately on the individual to speak up and say look this person's a terrible person who else is who else yeah. is, you know has anybody else got the same experience so and, and there may be a myriad of reasons why someone isn't speaking up um and that's completely understandable but mm -hmm. you know it may be the best thing to do to put an end to it to put an end to to future you know abuses i'm not I, I i i don't know i kind of from my own background i find people i find people that kind of abuse a position of power to be kind of uh in the nicest possible way kind of like the worst kind of people um and I also yeah, i'm I guessing agree. that chad them you know chad themselves they're in a position where I'm guessing that with their position of power themselves, they've got an ability to basically turn around to um, to these two, to Satine and Jameson, and tell them to go to go and tattoo themselves, knowing that the fact that he's probably can turn around to his, he can score that person off the um, the order book and not have to worry because he's now able to phone up somebody else who's in the 
the waiting list to say, hey, I've got space for you, come on, basically, I guess. Um, and I yeah. guess the thing with uh, with other people in different, if you're in a if you're in a more precarious position like these, you know, the other couple that were helping them at the at the event, maybe they weren't. You know, maybe this was them a chance to work with somebody who was potentially going to give them a kind of a leg up. You know, the Tristan and Katie. Um, maybe they thought as a way to leak up. So at the time, they thought, "Well, I'm just going to let them do what they need to do," kind of thing. I mean that that thread is basically that yeah they they basically wanted to do a stream on Pax West and they wanted to get a uh, like someone who's a bit more well known than them on their mm. stream in order to attract views which is perfectly reasonable and then it all went kind of horribly wrong and that is a, basically hit the nail on the head that that's exactly what happened it was like basically everything got to, everything I, I'd like to see way. I'd like to see somebody like that comes out and and they've shown they've got a good thing they've done a good thing for the community or something like that and they say do you know the reason that I did that good thing for everybody was because I had a really terrible experience as a child and therefore I'm suffering from you know, I, I'm suffering from complex po- post-traumatic stress disorder, which meant I went out and tried to help as many people as possible, as opposed to being the kind of the horrific person that does a whole pile of crappy things and then turns around and says, oh, I've been a crappy person because crappy things were done to me. You never kind of hear it on the kind of the switch around where, say, the people go, hey, that Ian McAllister, he's a really sound guy. And it's like, yeah, because he had some issues, but he's worked through them and he's proven himself to try and be a better person as opposed to Ian's been a terrible man. And, uh, yeah, and he comes out with the excuses, which it seems to be a pile of excuses. So, yeah, they could probably do one, I think. <laughs> Put them in the go do one box. <laughs> Hi, folks. This is Ian in the editing studio. I just wanted to do a little drop in on the Satine and Jameson story we just covered. On the 10th of June, the day after recording, Apotheosis Studios put out a statement on their website saying that Jameson Stone has resigned as the CEO. Uh, we'll bring you more, I'm sure, on that in the next cast. Thank you. Anyway, Jamie, news from the world of baking. Yes. Now, the Great British Bake Off. I'm sure people have heard of it. It kind of does exactly what it says on the tin if I'm mixing my products. It's a competition to find the best amateur bakers in the country. And I'm going to say it. I think it's somewhat of a cultural juggernaut. (sighs) Now, it's true, though. It is true. We reported on the last podcast that the show was getting a board game adaptation. Uh, But now it seems that has... Well, to use the lexicon from the show, it's gone a bit soggy. Uh, The TV show that aired in the US and Canada, it's the same show, but it's known as the Great British Baking Show. Now, Ravensburger, who's making the game, they have the rights to that name, but not to the Great British Bake Off. Which right now means that although the game is based in the UK, the show will not be... Yeah, sorry. Let me do that again. Okay. This means that although the show is based in the UK, and therefore the game technically is based in the uk as well the game will not be available in the uk at least for now now ravensburger i mean that's a company that's really i was going to say on the up and up but they've always really been on the up but with a design team like prospero hall behind them with things like villainous and jaws and top gun very apt where you have the flying the jets and you have the volleyball moments in the game i mean hopefully they can bring it here because that's that's a that's a that'd be a real coup for them i mean considering their involvement in ips it just seems like a massive oversight that they can't put it out in the uk very strange but it's yeah i mean like, like the spider-man are, are thing isn't like it their, their tie-ins are great spider-man thing well it's like spider-man and sony isn't it oh yeah, yeah. Oh, yes, you know what i mean it's like you can, you have the license if you have the license to control a control of ip is a funny thing isn't it it's like the reason why we don't have x-men and stuff like that all together in the marvel cinematic universe it's almost like it's almost like you've tried to bake a, a wolverine cake and you're not allowed to bring your wolverine <laughs> yes. cake to let paul hollywood not only you know have a finger of your sponges but also potentially give you a handshake afterwards. Family show, Richard. Family I think, show. I think, I think you'll find. I'm I think not, you'll find. I think this you'll is all find stuff that he's been checking. said. He is checking the firmness of the sponges, so the only person that's making smut out of this is you. But so, and, and the handshake afterwards. Um, and you've <laughs> made me lose my thread. But basically, what I'm saying is, there's no Wolverine cakes in the Bake Off tent because of IP restrictions. Uh, due to the Marvel Universe and Fox. 
So it's all a big mess. They need to get over it. I mean, I do, who who would have thought that the world of IP baking would have caused so much hassle? Well, you know, there was Kim. There was on the subject. There was Kim Joy's Magic Bakery, who was a oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, who was a contestant on the Great British Bake Off, and it took a wee while to come out, and I believe it has come out now. Yeah, um, I think so. And apparently, it's, it's it's not a bad wee game, but um, but yeah, it, it took a wee while. Yeah, I guess there's also there's always sort of weird sort of legal shenanigans around IPs, and we're going. I guess we're going to see a bit more of that, like games released in different countries, because we're seeing a lot more IP based games. They used to be like terrible like a lot of bo- ip board games were very very bad but well, hang on hang on Ian. i'm it, gonna i'm gonna put you it, up there it, a sec i'm gonna put you no, up there there's a lot of bad tie-ins look no yes we're, we're gonna see more ip games we've seen lots of ip games over many but, years we're, we're, yeah i think we're i think we're seeing a ramp up in that though especially with people like prospero hall producing yeah. all the film tie-in ones we're seeing like uh companies like uh um, mantic for instance produce computer game inspired board games i think we're seeing a lot more of that are you saying this is with it, are you saying this is leading it? to bake off talisman <laughs> well yeah obviously and that's you, what everyone wants right you actually need to bake the layers that surround the game for the expansions you don't actually get a board game expansion you get like a recipe card and it's like you're warning, ready to you bake get a bag of flour box. warning you a crispy base and avoiding a soggy bottom there's an entire dungeon crawling <laughs> thing based around baking, isn't there? And people haven't tapped into it. Yes. There was a Kickstarter a couple of years back that was a board game, like board games you could bake. I'm sure, like basically food based board games. I okay. can't remember who, who made it, but there was a quick <laughs> bite of like, f- like I think that stuff. was a fever dream that you had. <laughs> you know, it's not, I'm, I'm, I'm putting in the show I'll, I'll find it. But I'm I need find you to later. find this because I'm, I'm fascinated. I'm pretty sure this was like when you weren't feeling well that long ago. <laughs> <laughs> you woke up in the middle Thanks, of the night Richard. and went after, after <gasps> bakery, the bakery dungeon. Bakery. Right, <clears throat> bakery. Du- moving yeah. on from bakery dungeon to something a little bit more serious and financial news, which I'm not doing this time. So, Ian, on you go. Yeah, I've stolen Jamie's financial pants or whatever it is. I, I forget. There's a there's a style note somewhere. Back in episode 94, we covered the acquisition by the Embracer Group of Asmodee, the biggest board games company in the world. Embracer owns a variety of other publishers, including Dark Horse Publishing, and most recently, several parts of Square Enix, including the studio that makes Tomb Raider Crystal Dynamics. Well, big companies on the move attract investment, and it seems Embracer recently got an injection of cash from Saudi Arabia. First reported on website Polygon by Charlie Hall, the investment comes from Saudi Arabia's Sovereign Wealth Fund. The move seems to be part of a push by the kingdom to diversify its investments, as most of its current income is generated through oil. Saudi Arabia's public investment fund owns Savvy Gaming Group that made the investment. It puts Saudi Arabia as the second largest investor in Embracer, and it seems likely that some of this money will filter down through Embracer into Asmodee and some of the board game companies we all know and love. As I'm sure our audience is aware, Saudi Arabia is notorious for its human rights abuses, and in most recent memory, they have been accused of war crimes in Yemen, and the murder of journalist Jamal Khashoggi was a high-profile case worldwide. guess it begs the question, like, how much research should you do before buying a product? Like, what sort of ethical and moral considerations are there behind, like, purchasing games? Is anyone going to care about this kind of thing? I guess a bit, but... This kind of high-level investment is quite common in big companies, and it's going to become more common, I guess, as the board game industry grows. Anybody got any thoughts? Saudi Arabia's move on this is to try and divert most of their profits, or because a lot of their uh, their economy comes from oil, that they're trying to now get money from other places, which, you know, makes sense, because oil is a finite resource, funnily enough. Uh, and games why not are, go into... Board games are infinite. Board games, board games are infinite, ever. it's true. Yeah. <laughs> just just you can keep making board games forever they're, should, they're actually a perpetual motion machine <laughs> should the saudis then um, start but if, if i mean making let's board let's games. tip on you go richard on you go should they People start making me. should they start making board games instead listen if there's a if there's a robust uh design studio that wants to start out of Riyadh, i'd be all for that why not yeah for sure give it a shot I've seen this before and I see it every time like, you know, Nestle hits the news or Monsanto hits the news or, you know, any of these Mars companies or Coca-Cola hits the news or something like that and, and they do something terrible and 
people turn around and go, right, that's it, I'm boycotting them. And then somebody produces this chart and says, okay, well, this company's part of this company, it's part of this company, it's part of this company. So literally for you to boycott these products, you literally have to live in a tent for the rest of your life. And I think, yeah, I think that it's very, very difficult for you to be, I mean, let's face it, you could even look at the, the point of view that it's like, well, technically still people are using Kickstarter to, <laughs> to fund their projects and Kickstarter itself seems to be kind of heading down the dubious thing of blockchain and stuff like that. You know, are you right to still support kind of projects from really, really nice people that you yeah. really, really like if they're using the kind of like the Kickstarter model? I think it's really, really difficult. I think if you've got the ability to do that, then that's fine. But at the end of the day, it's like, well, what's their investment being used for? What part of the business is it going into? What is that money actually going to be used for itself? I mean, is it? I mean, a lot of this times investments type of things, people put these big companies put investment into stuff, and usually it's just to buy a whole pile of other things. It's not. It doesn't always. They say investment, but usually they'll 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 put money into Embracer, and they'll probably be sending Embracer out to buy up other companies, as opposed to be ploughing money into end product that's going to hit people's kind of uh, hit people's hands. I am being very serious, aren't I? I I'm going to start doing armpit farts. I, I, I think. I, I think. Unfortunately, <laughs> I think it's the. It's I mean, the, that's the, the kind of show we are. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say it's, it's the. the the orbit we're kind of in, which is there are times of being silly, but it's when we have to cover like things that are kind of important. We, yeah, there's you, you, you want, you want to make a sarcastic comment, but you don't want, I mean, I'll make us, I'll make not a sarcastic comment, but a, a, fun, a silly comment, which was, uh, Campbell, who's listening is in the audience has just posted, um, I'm sure during the pandemic, there was a point where non oil, which was a paint produced by Games Workshop was worth more than actual crude oil pound for pound. Mm. Seems like so it. if that, is, and I, I think I remember reading that. It might be true. If that is true, Mohammed bin Salman, if you're listening, old MBS, big fan, I know, friend of the show. Uh, invest in Games Workshop. No, What's the worst that could happen? Like, I'd like to make it very clear to everyone listening, including the CIA, that he's not a friend of the show. <laughs> of course he's not a friend of the show. You know my opinions <clears throat> on... Oh, <clears throat> yeah. I remember there being a skit in The Good Place, basically, where uh, like in one of the later seasons, there's a whole thing about it's basically impossible to be like a purely good person based on like your person that kind of thing because it's so hard to know who's yeah. involved with things and I, it's it's impossible to do that amount of research because you just don't have the time true but i have a number of food allergies which means i can avoid a lot of nestle and mars so no. i'm not complaining well i'm Indeed. the same i'm pretty much dairy free gluten free here so i mean i am technically just living in a house as opposed to living in a cave i mean that does then that then does justify stealing, shoplifting of board games. <laughs> I, th I think that's for a different cast, philosophy cast. Anyway, <laughs> let's, move, let's move on for shall we. Uh, Jamie, the, I'll give you back the financial pants and you can talk about Hasbro. Okay, but first, the rest of the news. More updates for you. Back in episode 93, we covered the Hasbro investor who had suggested that Hasbro should spin off Wizards of the Coast into a separate company. That investor was Alta Fox Capital Management. It owns about 2.5% of the company, which is worth about $325 million, give or take. Alta Fox also wanted to add new members to the company's board that it proposes. In response, Hasbro put out the following letter on Wednesday the 18th of May from the CEO, Chris Cox. The Hasbro board nominees have the right balance of skill sets, experiences and fresh perspectives to guide our new CEO, Chris Cox, and our management team in executing our long-term strategy for the benefit of all shareholders. According to the letter to shareholders, which was obtained by CNBC. AltaFox is attempting to replace three of our highly skilled and experienced directors with nominees who lack relevant industry expertise and, in our view, possess inferior skill sets. Hasbro has dismissed many of the nominees AltaFox put forward as having insufficient experience in the toys and games market, and that, quoting from the letter, In our view, AltaFox's nominees, given their limited relevant qualifications, would not be additive to the board in helping Hasbro achieve its long-term strategy. 
Hasbro lists a lot of the failures of the board members that Alta Fox are proposing and seems adamant that the spin-off of Wizards should not proceed considering the current strength of Dungeons and & Dragons and Magic the Gathering. On June the 8th, the vote went ahead and ICV2 reported that Hasbro defeated the efforts by Alta Fox to put members on the board. The win was by a substantial margin, apparently. In a statement accompanying the announcement, Hasbro said... Our directors will be instrumental to Chris as he undertakes a strategic review of the business and outlines our go-forward strategy to position Hasbro for long-term success and delivery of shareholder value. So what this was was a big, long, nice try, lads, jog on. Yeah, we're just going to see more of this as the hobby grows. We're going to see investment in board game companies as they attract bigger bigger people with eyes on them and wanting a bit of that slice of that pie, I guess. So, uh- and Sam, what's your opinion on this? Hello. I, it goes back into a lot of like the, the previous piece of news as well with the Embracer Group stuff. Is that yeah? It's and I think in the grand scheme of things as well, this is kind of fine in a sense. But like these people aren't in it for board games, right? No. These people are there for money. The Embracer Group are, but you know, in that previous piece of news, they're buying a board game company, but they're not buying it because they love board games. It's because it's a profitable thing, and this is exactly what this is. You know, you've got an investment mark, investment management thing coming on. You know, it says they own about two point five percent of the company, and they just want more influence in that company. Obviously, Hasbro's rebuttal has been actually very games focused, which people obviously really like it's good show for them obviously but yeah as ian said it's only gonna happen more um i think it's all natural business stuff isn't it but i suppose for the moment good on them for for winning it just having a little look at who own or not who owns embracer group uh, what embracer group owns including things like asthma day um Things that are interesting, like Coffee Stain Studios and Ghost Ship Games, who make uh, the game Deep Rock Galactic, the video game and coming board game that I know some of us are big fans of. Um, Dark Horse Comics and Entertainment, Gearbox Software. Yeah, this is oof. As I say, they've gone on, Embracer have gone on a massive spending spree. Somebody's handed them a blank checkbook and they've basically gone out and bought lots and lots of little kind of lots of little things like we'll have you know it's like countdown i'll have one off the top two off the middle and the three off the bottom please if you don't mind and that's what they've been doing so it comes back to you can't you can't you can't try and claim a moral high ground here <laughs> because unless yeah. you're really really aware of what they've been buying there's a chance you're going to be putting money in somebody's back pocket that's doing something a bit dodgy so i'm afraid i don't think any of us who are up on stage right now attended the UK Games Expo uh, over the past weekend or so it's, it's um, rubbish. for various reasons. It's rubbish. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> it was rubbish. <laughs> Terrible. Never going again. Full of nerds. Well, Full of nerds. Full well, of people UK, I wouldn't be seen with in public. Well, you, you know. <laughs> this is why you appear with them on a podcast. <laughs> the detriment well, of society. You know, literally, you know, people UK games, the street of us. UK so. Games Expo had its why am i doing this this is ian's uh this is ian's story i can do it if yes, you want indeed it's mine i can do Go it ahead, oh, yeah then. you do it i could do it or Shoot. sam could do it i'll do it and then sam could do the next one okay so this I is do the... one well good then you could do one. I, I wouldn't be good at the. i'm not going to be good at the next one <laughs> no, the next have you seen what the next one is series. yes hey, i have come on next... hey Cam, well, do i can do this one. one we'll do this one then you don't have to change the name of the i'm gonna do it either. i'm gonna do it God, we're super ramshackle. We'll 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 so we'll oh, here we go. I haven't even read this. Okay, you do one sentence. I'll do the next one, okay? You do the first okay. one. Okay. The UK Games Expo, the biggest tabletop trade show in the UK and third largest in the world, had its 2022 show last weekend over the 4th, 5th and 6th of June. They had 23,163 unique way visitors. For a total att- for, for a total attendance... Of 39,527 people. The last pre-pandemic year the Expo went ahead was 2019, and they reported 25,704 unique ways with an attendance of 45,907 great unwashed people. That's not fair. Anyway... So fewer people came along this year, and it seems that people are sticking around for... Less time than they usually do. What so, do we think, gang? 
Yeah, the pandemic may be over, but will it take a while for everything to get back to normal? And also, why no COVID policy? And hotels seem really expensive yeah. for next year as well, you know. They are extremely expensive for next year. The, uh, yeah, uh, basically there is a, we've reported the last cast, there is an exchange between uh, some Twitter users and Games Expo about their COVID policy and the fact they didn't have one. And they said they would put uh, something before the con and then didn't. I look. I had a quick look at some of the other conventions that were using the NEC space, including one of the BBC sort of baking sort of, uh, conventions, basically the sort of big, big sort of good food kind of convention. And they basically they had a COVID policy, which was effectively like we can't really enforce anything. If you want to wear a mask, that's cool. Uh, we will absolutely support you in doing that, and it might be a good idea to take a lateral flow test before you came. That is kind of all I was expecting from UK Games Expo, and they did. Nada. I think that's because... Now, I don't agree with what I'm about to say. Caveat, and I'm, I don't think it's the general view of the um, of of the Giant Brain or the Brainwaves podcast, but the idea that they don't need to, right? Yeah. And that actually not having one is probably actually quite attractive to a certain demographic of people, and they're going to prefer true. that. You yeah. mentioned the BBC there. Frankly, you'd expect the BBC to have something like that in place, because again, like yeah. image and stuff. But why shouldn't the UK Games Expo also be portraying a similar image? Yeah. But yeah, I think it's one of those things of, are people kind of moving on from it and like, you know, just getting over it and not having these things in place because they technically don't need to anymore. For sure. For sure. They, yeah. they legally I mean, don't the need to anymore. Mm. Yeah, but yeah. it's also a case that it makes it un, it makes it unenforceable as well. Because technically, it's like it becomes like yeah. your policy as a business to either allow it, and then also, you're then, funnily enough, you're then mixing it in with the policy of the actual um, event hall itself. So if that differs from, you know, you could say, well, it says out here on the actual, it says in the actual event rules that I'm allowed to do what I want, whereas you've got your policy to say that you're stopping me from doing what I want to do and I've paid for a ticket and I've paid for this and I've paid for that. So I think at the end of the day they went, well, what can they physically do if the if the big giant heads at the top are saying, well, there's not, there's not any rules anybody needs to follow? I think sometimes you just put yourself in the unfortunate situation where you can say, well, if you want to, you can, you know. I think those people who were going to... If you put out a COVID policy and you're asking people to do stuff, I think the people who are going to follow it are the people who are going to wear masks and bring hand sanitizer and all that stuff anyway. Yeah, exactly. And I'd be interested to know, are places having at the moment, like any con out there, whatever, whatever it might be, if they're putting something up online that says, here's our COVID policy, what's the comment section looking like? I'd kind of be interested to know. Is it just people being like, oh, I thought we'd move it. Is it is, yeah, is it like the negative stuff? Or is it more, oh, thanks for this? Because, you know, I don't want to have like a doom and gloom look on the world, but I am I reckon it's probably going to lean more towards the people hating on the convention for having that in place. I'm not saying that's a good thing. You say doom and gloom, I'd say sadly realistic. Yeah, but... You get you will get people right. that are like, they'll be, you, they'll go like, well, that's it, you've lost my money this year, and it'll be like, you know, Jay Jones from Cincinnati. <laughs> kind of thing. Nowhere, yeah. nowhere near the convention, but just has to, call, you know, just has to kind of type down their absolute disgust at a situation to an event they're never going to go to, just to express how you're interfering with my human rights not to wear a mask kind of thing. So, yeah, I think it was like, if you get, you were going to do it anyway if you are going to wear a mask, weren't you? Let's face it. I mentioned in the States, there's a new charity bundle out, Jamie. We've reported many times on the generosity of the tabletop community when it comes to raising money for people caught in tragic circumstances. On the 14th of May, an 18-year-old white man shot and killed 10 people at a Topps supermarket in Buffalo, New York, injuring two others. To support the families and friends of victims and survivors of this mass shooting, there's a bundle on itch.io raising funds for Black Love Resists in the Rust, which is a member-led abolitionist organisation of black folk and POC that believe, through leadership development, a shared politic and community organising, we will build safe and flourishing communities that resist the ills of white supremacist, sit heteropatriarchal capitalism, including policing. We ground our work in these four pillars, transformative organising, healing justice, embodied leadership, and political education. 
The organization will be using the money to pay for mental health services, as well as giving help to the community at this incredibly difficult time. Now, the bundle can be bought for $5 and has just under $1,000 worth of product in it. At the time of recording, they have raised $3,744 out of a $10,000 goal. I've got nothing to say on this apart from I am really sad that it's necessary. Yeah. That, that these situations have to come up for these things to uh, to be produced. But that being said, it is, you know, I'm glad to see it is doing well. Have we got any comments? Um, all, all I was going to say is just urge people to go out and get it because you can get some cool stuff. Just talk about what's in the bundle, basically. Lots of tabletop RPGs, it seems like. Um, we got a very cool thing called uh, Sausage Bomber. This is a Steam game, but it's called Sausage Bomber and what's not to love? Um, <laughs> Sausage Bomber just sounds, sounds fantastic. I mean, what exactly. does not want to? I, I'd suggest everybody click the link in the show notes and when this is live... Um, Especially, especially if you're an RPG fan, yeah. there's a lot of even RPGs in that bundle. Even some cool if stuff you're to not check an out. RPG, or it's like five bucks, which is yeah. literally like about four pound. It's probably five bucks, which is literally about five pounds <laughs> at the moment, <laughs> yeah. based on our exchange rate. But yeah, it's an ab- absolutely fantastic four, four pound and six pence, according to Google. Wow, there you go. Well, there you go. Um, oh, yeah, can I, can I also just a couple more things that. that um, caught my interest when I was looking at this a while ago, which was a thing called Dark Space. And it's an immersive virtual murder mystery for five friends in the dark of space. Cool. And uh, good. Yeah. And a uh, The Mysteries of Addy C, which is a solo game where you play as a paranormal investigator staying 13 nights at a haunted bed and breakfast. House of Nuts, a multi-generational story about squirrels surviving in a kingdom of suburbia. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that sounds amazing. amazing. That sounds amazing. <laughs> you know. Anyway, Jamie, let's move on. Nuts in the dark. Kind of like blades in the dark, but with squirrels. Let's, let, I want to play that now. Better move on. Ian, there is news from Funforge. Funforge are the publishers of Takedo, amongst many other games, and in recent years have had some troubles delivering games through Kickstarter. Now it seems they are to give the crowdfunding platform a wide berth as they've announced their intention to move all products back to distribution and direct to retail in order to help with cash flow problems. They have said they are pausing progress on all current Kickstars, the most recent of which were Namiji, the follow-up to Takedo, and the Monumental reprint. Namiji is currently going out to backers, but Monumental was still in production. They say in the statement that unforeseen increases in the cost of production is the main reason for this move. Now, we all know that production and shipping are becoming major issues for board game publishers uh, across the spectrum. I don't personally fully understand why going straight to retail is going to help them improve that situation. Crowdfunding gets you money up front, allows you to do the production. And yes, of course, if you haven't factored in the like some increase in shipping costs, a lot of people are struggling with that side. But going straight to retail means you're having to wait for a lot of money to come in. And you're still having to distribute those games somehow. You're still having to ship them. So I don't quite understand how this is going to solve their problem no now just a point just to say that you mentioned uh lovely walk simulator takaido again a game i absolutely love and i think i gave to sam uh they did also publish a bunch of other games such as brass birmingham uh brass mm. lancashire mm. caverna agricola okay, okay. park mm, okay quantum I'm kind of I'm kind of surprised that they haven't kind of with that kind of back catalog that they haven't approached the kind of the retail angle more robustly um i guess from my point of view there's a lot of there's a lot of people kind of having that having that pain i seen a i think a kickstarter update from a company recently that said literally we need we need 250,000 dollars in order to be able to, sh- to 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 even consider shipping this to you i think it was um yeah, I can't remember. I think it's maybe it wasn't Ether Fields or something like that, but it was certainly one of these uh, one of the bigger projects that has come out, and they just basically say we're a quarter of a million dollars down in shipping, so we need help with that. But it seems like I kind I of like, like I feel like we covered that. Yeah, it has been did. horrendous. Like it has been horrendous for publishers, but I'm not sure that coming off Kickstarter is the answer to that those problems. But anyway, we'll see what happens. I I, I was quite looking for for to to Kaido Duel, the two player one. I was mm. quite wanting to get a chance to play that, but yeah. 
uh, Gavin in our uh, Lodge Theater chat says the two player Takeda was at UK Games Expo and it looked like a beaut. Oh, good. Yeah. That, is it, that okay, one. so are we heading towards a kind of a GMT <sighs> P500 type model then? We're basically what's going to I mean, some, I would, I'd imagine some might go to that, yeah. The, the pe- for people who don't know the, 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 the 500, it's, they will put games, GMT, company from things like Twilight Struggle, 1960, the making of a president, uh, to name but few. Uh, they have a crowdfunding of sorts on their website whereby they'll put up ideas for games and if it gets 500 backers, they'll put it into yeah. production. I'm, I've got that right, yeah? I said that without even moving my lips. How do you like that? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah. let's get this. Anyway, I'm going to move the show on a little bit because we need to get like the actual show a bit over so that Richard can come and like uh, probe our see, minds for questions. No, I uh, see this. You see, this is my plan from overall. Can I spend so long talking about this news <laughs> <laughs> that it's like one question? We'd like to take a moment to give a, a little shout out to our patrons, especially James Nail and Sean Newman, our executive producers. We'll get linked to all of James and Sean's bits and pieces in the show notes. You can support us on Patreon and through various bits and pieces that we're involved with. You can get Dice from Metallic Dice Games, uh, t-shirts from Sir Meeple, and we'll link to all our other little bits and pieces in the show notes. And I'm actually going to get to do an outro bit this year, this week. Yay! This, this year, yes. This year. Yeah, probably this year, let's face it. You, you mostly do the outro. I mostly do the outro because, yeah, well, now Sam's here. We we, we, you know, we we can say, you know, we we started the Monopoly news on the Meeple People podcast that Sam and I did ages ago. Mm. Yeah. And it, it just ran. And you, like the poor sap you are, let us continue it. I keep meaning to get, like, sponsorship for that. We're, like, one, we must be one of the only board game podcasts that talk regularly about Monopoly. <laughs> for sure. It's worth it. You anyway. get great news from it. It, it, is is it. Thank you. It is amazing news. Some of, some of it's brilliant. Yeah, absolutely it's, fantastic. It's all right. Right, yeah. Ian, on you go. Okay, this was originally posted on the 1st of April, but apparently real things do actually happen on that day. It was submitted in June 2021 and accepted in February of this year. So that leads a little bit more authority to what I'm about to say. Box farts. They're a serious condition affecting a majority of boxes. <laughs> <laughs> on the website of the American Physical Society, a paper was published hold on, Ian, by Ian. We're, we're going to have to what? take what what are, what is a box fart? You know, when you push a box down, a box lid down onto the base of a box, it like air lets out, and it the box farts. Box Can we get farts. a live one on the podcast? Uh, <laughs> one moment. Uh, one moment. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Yes. Oh, yes. Jamie's going for that. Oh, I have a go. copy of Lawyer Up by Rock. It needs to be a big game. game usually. It needs to. Be oh, big. it's not. It's it's to. not big. I don't have any big I games. Find hold on. Hold on, oh, only go. fans. Thank you, Gavin. Uh, okay, I'm holding my box next to the next People to the mic. People will pay for box farts on only fans. I don't know if can you hear. heard that. It was a I think can, can hear. I think Discord might have muted. <laughs> that was a silent but a silent but deadly a, one. Silent anyway, but deadly. I've got one. I've got the perfect game. I've got it. It's working. It's happening. This is uh, Quadropolis. I'm going to turn oh. my gain up on my microphone. Okay. Sure. Okay. Here we go. It's top quality content here, folks. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Mm-hmm. Ooh. Good ball. Oh, let's keep going. There we go. That was amazing. Quality awesome. reporting. Thank you very much. Uh, you turn your game. On the turn. website of the American Physical Society, a paper was published by a bunch of people I'm going to attempt to pronounce. Cholette de Ritur, Emily, uh, Emile Visby Ostergaard, Sean Marker, and Kerr H. Jensen. Sorry, Kara H. Jensen entitled Fluid Physics of Telescoping Cardboard Boxes. Box farts to you and me. Why should we care? Well, it depends on what field you work or are interested in, but it specifically mentions board game boxes and suggests an optimal design for a rapidly closing box. We'll link to the paper in the show notes. Synopsis of the paper, Fooling Around with Boxes, by Catherine Wright, Deputy Editor of, Editor of Physics. In the summer of 2018, Carr Jensen was tidying up some lidded boxes in his lab at the Technical University of Denmark when he noticed something odd. The lids of the boxes all took different lengths of time to fall into place. He investigated the literature to see if anyone knew why, but he couldn't identify any studies that explored this topic. Jensen and his colleagues decided to rectify that and started collecting more lidded boxes to study, including one for an iPad and another for the game Settlers of Catan. Later, they also 3D printed the lids and base the boxes with specific designs. 
They also uncovered the optimal base and lid shapes for making the lids close as quickly and smoothly as possible. The optimum lid is perfectly square, while the sides of the base taper such that they are closer together at the base's top than at its bottom. Science, folks. Board games, science. Doing God's the work. best in tabletop gaming. <laughs> science, boy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, anyway, you... Jamie, your turn. <laughs> okay, moving away from box farts to a heartwarming story from Western Australia now. In the town of Bunbury, Western Australia, Holly and Simon have got engaged through a card game. According to the Bunbury Mail, Muffin Time requires players to have 10 cards exactly to win, but cards may be gained or lost through actions on some cards. Included in the deck are blank cards, where Simon wrote his marriage proposal. Now, during the game, Holly had to steal one of his cards. Guess which card she ended up stealing? At which point, Simon produced the ring. Now, this apparently happened on New Year's Day, so I hope they're still very happily together. Congratulations. I know it's six months down the line, but nice. <sighs> give me all this niceness and, and celebration I don't care about. Give, give, it, give, give me the Monopoly news. That's what oh, can, I, can, I, oh. can I make a request? Yes, sir. What? Can I take Monopoly News episode 100? Yes, you yeah, can, absolutely. sir. I would love to. So around five years ago, um, as Jamie said in the, in the little preamble, I don't know if it's going to make the cut, but Jamie and I hosted a podcast called the Meeple People Podcast. Um, and yeah, we had this thing about running Monopoly News and it's made its way into 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 brainwaves and it's carried on and I'm very happy to see some here. Um, but yeah, about five years ago in around 2017, Hasbro ran a contest to bring a new counter into Monopoly. You could vote on a penguin, a rubber duck, a T-Rex and the winner, surprise, surprise, um, was a T-Rex. No, no, it was, no, it was. Wait, what? Were... It was all of them. I'm you, reading it wrong. Sorry, no, one moment. It's fine, no, it's fine, because I actually had to listen to the podcast again, which was weird. Um, there were 50 choices, and the three that won were Penguin, Rubber Duck, and T-Rex. There you go. Um, the boot, the, the wheelbarrow, choices. and the... <laughs> the boot, yes. the wheelbarrow, and the thimble were all kicked out of the box. But essentially, people don't know what's good for them, they don't know what they want, and they're doing another vote. They're, they're doing more things, and the thimble is back. The T-Rex is gone. Get out, bringing the thimble back, classic Monopoly, yeah boy. No, I, I will say it's it's five years later and I'm still annoyed that uh, that my vote for sliced bread as one of the counters uh, was completely rejected. I think people like the thimble. You can wear the Why? thimble. It's it's um, tactile, that's the word. T-Rex ain't tactile, what are you going to do with that? But why get rid of the T-Rex when Jurassic, you know, the Jurassic films are coming back to our cinemas? You know, you've got a bit of a tie in there. Why get rid of the T-Rex at that juncture? Why get rid of the T-Rex when you can get rid of the cat? Do you think that the T-Rex sculpt is going to be used in Jurassic World Dominion Monopoly? And also, from a practical point of view, T-Rex are very, very difficult at rolling dice. With those tiny hands, they find it almost impossible to pick up the dice after they've rolled them. So it's not just a kind of we don't want the T-Rex, it's the fact that you could be playing as the T-Rex and it could expand the game on the Monopoly for another three hours is you have to try and pick up the dice while being a T-Rex, which means, you know, it's just physically impossible. So that's why they got rid of it. It was a practical reason. I rest my case. I see. I, well, I like those, I like those comments of um, Campbell saying he can't play Monopoly without wearing the little hat. See what I mean? People practically Campbell, Campbell got use a very it. tiny head. Well, like maybe he just has. Head. It's part of the game. He has to balance the hat on his head, and if he drops the well, hat, a drop his head, element, what mm. he almost has to give away like a pound every time he drops his hat off of his head. That is pretty <laughs> much how it would. That is pretty much how it would work. So why is Monopoly if it's nothing but fresh? Keeps reinventing itself. True. It's wonderful. It's the Madonna of the board game world. It is. As it's always going to be there. As long as it doesn't do a topless kind of monopoly, which is what we don't oh. want, because otherwise you wouldn't want kind of like the board pieces kind of kind of going every... They've every... done it. There was sexy monopoly, wasn't there? That happened. That was a thing. Came with some handcuffs. It's like sexy yep. monopoly. Oh, that, that wasn't sexy. Like that was it. cheater's monopoly. Yeah. There was a sexy one, though, right? There was like yeah. an adults only. Listen, there is almost certainly. 
Gavin, Probably. I have seen Madonna recently, and let's face it, I wish I'd closed back the lid of the box. Um, it's a, it's right. a, it's a hundred episodes okay. <laughs> on that bombshell. <laughs> this joint is mine, as he would say. Yep. As he would say. Um, we we'll let Richard take over. I remember a long time ago, a couple of years ago, a young man by the name of Ian McAllister, and we had ended up kind of talking back and forward, started a conversation which was, look, I want to run something past you. We were thinking about producing a kind of a, a, a kind of a topical news show, put a, lot, a bit of comedy in there um, and see how we run with it. And, you know, I, I was one of the people that was privileged to kind of hear the the kind of the, the mock together episode. I'm really glad that they went ahead and dropped the comedy bit uh, and stuck with the, yeah, the episode that no, no one will ever hear. <laughs> stuck, with the, stuck with the serious stuff. It's now been 100 episodes. People have come and gone. Um, but back in the fold, we have the absolutely wonderful, the wonderful Sam. And it's like, it's almost like you can't say Sam without saying it in the Lord of the Rings kind of Sam. Because he's here, he's back, he's dependable, he's lovely, he's gorgeous. How are you, Sam? Because I'm going to ask you some questions. I will How are you doing? carry you. How are I'm you? Good. Are you doing, are you doing well? Yeah? I'm doing, I'm doing well. I just, it's a quick I, I've question. I've got a window open, you, there's a slight breeze. It's lovely. Good. Have you managed to sit down with um, Jamie and Ian and work through the issues that caused you to leave the podcast in the first place. <laughs> they were interdimensional issues. You physically, we, we physically couldn't sit in the same uh, reality to, to even do that. I don't even know how this is happening right now. I went through a wormhole. I, I think I maybe came back once after going through the wormhole hole, but it's a, it's a mess of time and space. Are you, are you, I mean, are you, are you in speaking terms now? I mean, I, I, I mean, um, are you are you happy to talk to each other now? I mean, is this going to be a one-off? Is Occasionally, it, like going to happen, like today, I hear voices, I answer them, I'm happy to do so. Um, so yeah. that may or may not be absolutely physically present within the Giant Brain HQ, depending on how you <laughs> you know determine your physical reality. I, I don't want to you know exclude is it people like, with p- is potentially it like multiple quantum- eyes or who can see into different dimensions. Is it like a quantum leap type thing, where he's kind of he's, he's actually he's actually transported himself into another body, and is there playing the role of Sam? I think right. it's more um, like Interstellar. I'm Matthew McConaughey in the walls of the of Brainwaves HQ, uh-huh. <laughs> and I am influencing dice throws. With I think that's, one, with, that's why it's been going wrong for me so much recently. With right? I think gravitational yeah. waves, yeah. I think that's kind of okay. wonderful and kind of, and kind of beautiful. You see, you, see you, you mentioned you mentioned being in the walls, and unfortunately, I had I put on Encanto at work today for for children. So now I've just got you slinking through, just going. We don't talk about Sam. No, no, no. That's me. That's you. I'm the guy in the walls. You're John Leguizamo. Sure. I'm John Leguizamo. I'm Matthew McConaughey. I I'm whoever you want me to be. Pee Wee Herman. Yes. Yeah. As long as he's in the walls, that's me. As long as he's in the walls, that would be me. Oh, look. Oh, we've got a question. We've got a... Gavin has obviously been, been chomping at the bit to ask this. Um, and he says, if you could have... If you could have one special guest newsreader, who would it be? And why would it be Sir Trevor McDonald? It's not. It's more of a Stuart every day. Moira, Moira Stewart. Moira, Sam's going to Sam's bringing Moira Stewart. Ian, if you could have one special guest newsreader, who would it be, and why would it be Sir Trevor Macdonald? Well, it, it definitely wouldn't be Sir Trevor Macdonald. We did have guests for a little point. There was a period where we had like guest news presenters, and that was the thing did. we did for a while. It was, uh, and that was that was a cool period. That was a cool period of the cast. Um, it, it got a little unwieldy, and like what didn't always work, depending on who the guest was. But All yeah, right, okay, yeah, it was pretty okay. Cool. I'm in the room. I'm right here. Okay, but yeah. if, you could have any, if you could have anyone at all, I, I, uh, hmm, anyone at all, uh, Matt Matt from Shop and Sit Down would be an interesting newsreader. I think I think he's got some really interesting opinions about the sort of the board game industry in general, and it'd be interesting to have him on, and like sort of chat about interesting, uh, like like sort of his view on like current news stories. Okay, Send the email in. Close. Get, get the ball. Not rolling. what I've got on the card. What about you, Jamie? 
Okay. Um, do they have to be alive right now? Why have you killed them? No. He's going, he's going for Gandhi. Jamie always goes for Gandhi. It's always Gandhi with Jamie. It's literally, it's literally it's Gandhi all the way down me. with Jamie. I've literally just stabbed him no, um, two so, times. So Trevor McDonald is good. I'm gonna go. Yeah. I'm gonna go for someone else with uh, an equally as uh, iconic uh, voice, and I'm gonna go for the late great Orson Welles. Oh really? Okay. I think I think that I think the man's timbre would be very interesting, and I think his. Almost a legendary disdain. Oh, he would add a quite a oh, it would quite a, would be add quite a frisson to the. To also, the also had a very famous um, advanced Dungeons and Dragons uh, campaign running just before he died. So did he? Oh, oh <laughs> sure, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Let's well, right well, find out if the Orson Welles estate sues us after this cast. <laughs> it's just interesting yes, to see kind of always. Jamie get thoroughly kind of reeled in by that. Oh, really, did he? I know. I wonder what kind I know. Of thing. You can imagine it just an Orson Welles kind of dungeon. It's just like, you go into the room, you're rubbish. You know, because that, if you read any of the kind of the, the transcripts of him chatting about any actor or director he was working with, he thought they were absolutely, everybody was absolutely terrible. Yeah. Campbell... All, all, all I'll say is, last, last word on Orson Welles, which is, if you haven't listened to it, go listen to his uh, Frozen Peas recording. Oh, Craig in the chat, thank you, Craig, has suggested not Tom Waits, Jamie, and I go, no. oh, that's a very good point. Yeah, that'd be great. Tom Waits would be amazing. I mean, he is basically incomprehensible now, but... How <laughs> dare you? It's true. <laughs> Plus, I, I, would come up with the most amazing facts. I think there is definitely something in having someone along who just just doesn't care at all. Like bring Bob Dylan in and have him talk yeah. about board games and yeah, just so see a, be an see where it runs. There, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> like what? <laughs> It'd be wonderful. Is this where you roll a dice? Is this what you yeah? <laughs> um Anyway, Campbell. This is my part of the show, so back off, everybody. He says, Campbell says, oh, okay, I'm doing this too. I don't know if this is your accent, Campbell. It could be this. <laughs> oh, okay, I'm doing this too. <laughs> if you can bring back one big person in history to play a board game with you, who are you inviting to play and what game are you asking them to play? And I'm going to bring that straight into the lap of Jamie. Oh, that's fair enough, because I answered it last, last time. Um You did. I first don't know. Now, my first thought is to get some kind of military leader and play a war game with them. But I'm going to go with the first thing off the top of my head, and that is uh, I'd like to see how noted hair haver um, Karl Marx would do with games like Brass. Oh, that'd be interesting. When you called him noted hair haver... I really yeah. hoped you were going down like the guess who route. Yeah. <laughs> As a guess, I'm going to flip everybody. Is it this? Is it that? <laughs> if, 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 I could, if it could be, if, if it could be one, if it could be one person. Oh, yeah, it's Karl, Karl Marx. If it was two, I'd go Marx and Engels. If it was three people, Marx, Engels and Adam Smith and get them you... all playing brass together and see how that would work. I was going to say get Hitler playing secret Hitler. But, um... No, that's, nah. <laughs> that's so, nah, that's I, so I, 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 do you know why? I, why? Do you know why? I, I don't think he'd be very enjoyable to play it with. I don't probably no. I know, I know. It wasn't meant to be, you know, serious. But no, I know. Okay, I know. Sam, if you could, if okay, I'll do a different voice. Hello, you, uh, hello, Sam. If you can get one big person in history to play a board game with you, who are you inviting to play, and what game are you asking them to play? First, the, like the fun ones that come to mind is like let's play Cluedo with Ag Agatha Christie. Let's play um, let's play Mysterium with someone like Conan Doyle. Hey, let's play Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective with Conan Doyle. Um, yeah, how good is he at his own thing? Yeah, but you know he's going to get really annoyed and he's going to be like, uh, but nobody talks about fairies. But ultimately, I think beautiful. And then, Jamie, thank you. I live in Edinburgh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so they're not even dead but i think i I'd, I'd like to play some nice you know low level games i'm talking i, I don't know just something like okay play something real nice and simple 
nice and chill. You can have a nice conversation with Paul McCartney. I think that'll be a fun afternoon. I think he's the kind of guy who wants to sit around and just chat and, and just, yeah. Is this before or after he died in the mid-60s? Oh, yeah, it is a person from history. I will go with Paul McCartney number two. Okay, cool. Paul McCartney. Um, I, I think we're on number four or five at the moment. There you are. And uh, finally, the same question to uh, Ian. If you could play with one big person in history to play a board game with, who are you inviting to play? And what game are you asking them to play? Okay, so he's not a big person in history, but one of my favourite authors was Ian Banks and oh. died way too young. Uh, and I think it'd be really interesting to sit down and play a couple of two-player games with some sci-fi themes, per- preferably because of the culture novels. And just chat to him about his creative process and like how he how he writes books and yeah he wrote a couple of books that have games in them he wrote Player of Games which is uh, quite you know game focused mm-hmm. and he wrote uh, a book I haven't actually read I've got but I never actually got around to reading it called The Steep Approach to Carbondale which oh. is about a board game dynasty family a family that makes this board game and it becomes incredibly popular and they've got all this money from I the board have game. read that yeah I I, I haven't read that. And, and you, you uh, that's uh, or yeah or have I? So, I had it on my shelf at one point. I can't remember if I read it or I've not. I've got it lying around somewhere. But yeah, so yeah, I'd really like to sit sit down with Ian Banks and play some two player games and, and chat about his creative process because he was a fantastic writer and I went to see him speak a couple of times and he was a, he was just a lovely man. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that, Gavin. Gavin Jones. Gavin, he's look very happy. Gavin doesn't. He? He's a very smiley person in the Discord, and he's a, he's a lovely, genuinely seems to be a lovely guy. That you would probably, if he was, if there, he was one big person in history, I'd like to play a game with Gavin Jones. I'll be honest. Um, what's Aww. Jamie's favourite Monopoly? And you have to choose. There can be only one. So I like thinking of the the phrasing of this question. I like. It, me and Ian have to choose what Jamie's favourite Monopoly is. <laughs> yeah, <I know. laughs> That's what yeah. the question's asking. You have to choose. What's Jamie's favourite Monopoly? What? You have to choose. What is Jamie's favourite Monopoly? Everybody. What is Jamie's favourite Monopoly, Sam? Um, Monopoly, Sam. Oh, I think, going down, like, theme and stuff like that, Jamie's into... Thing, I don't even know if Star Trek Monopoly exists, but I well, think he'd like it, something it like that. Be, sure. It has to exist, but who knows? Yeah, absolutely. But then also I know that Jamie does like, you know, a, a, a change of the rules. So any of those versions of Monopoly that actually change things up a slight bit, you know, Cheetah's Monopoly, I've never played it, but I think Jamie would probably give it a go um, because it's not your classic run of the, the, run of the mill Monopoly. Yeah. That's- that's a good story. Am I close, Jamie? Am I yeah. in the right well, ballpark there? Let Ian, let's Ian ask, answer the question next, which is what is Jamie's favourite We've covered Monopoly? so many versions of Monopoly. Yes, we have. So many versions. <laughs> and I and remember quite them, a few of them, sadly. Most of them go out of my head almost instantly, I have to say. I love covering them, but they it's not knowledge I retain. So what's your favourite <laughs> Monopoly? Um... Uh, <laughs> Oh, I've got another one as well. I can add another I, I, one. I, 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 I'm going to go with Sam's suggestion. I think I think those are good suggestions. Jamie will definitely give new games a try. Because he's like, personally, he'll give a new game a try no matter what. I think Jamie would also just like a good old-fashioned Glasgow Monopoly. Definitely exists it's out there. I think There's one for every place. Must Gavin's be, yeah. putting a couple of comments here. One of them, he says, the Her Majesty the Queen Elizabeth II Monopoly, which she owns everything anyway. So that's how that game starts. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it's a and very short game. the second one is, is for when you're, <laughs> when, you're play it. when you're quite sad and if you've got a long face, you've got the Horse Lovers Monopoly. <laughs> <laughs> or... <laughs> Uh, good to see all one person in the audience got that one. Um, oh, he's oh he's asking Monopoly art art. Okay, so out of the His Majesty the Queen Elizabeth of Monopoly, Monopoly Horse Lovers Edition, and Monopoly Artichoke, which is the fake one. Uh, Monopoly Horse Lovers Edition. There you go. Is that your favorite? I mean, your, Mon- your, Mon- actually, your favorite Monopoly Mon- Artichoke is definitely the fake one. He's, I'm waiting, I think. I'm waiting. I, t- I think artichoke. I know that the queen one is real because I'm I'm looking yeah. at it right now. I'm trying to zoom in on the board. I want to know what the um what the spaces oh. are. I, I will I, I will say this: there is a website called World of Monopoly where I don't know who it is, but they are absolutely wonderful, and they put up like so many sets of Monopoly and where you can get them. You can just click uh, on it. You've got it I, on your I, bookmarks I, tab. You know you've got it in your bookmarks and you just click on it. You I have to. You know what? I don't, but I just remember it. Um, I will say my favourite uh, version yes. of Monopoly. Now, this might be slightly cheating. 
uh, because it is Monopoly Deal, which is the card game version. Yep. I knew it would be different. I was right. Yep. You were, you were absolutely right and there's something different, but it is uh, not the traditional board version. It is Monopoly Deal. Um, mm. if, if I was able to put uh, inverted commas around the favourite Monopoly, um, it would be, as in my least favourite, I think it would be the Monopoly Socialism edition because it was dripping with... It wasn't even sarcasm or even sardonic tone. It was just... Terrible. Just mean. And it just it just seemed really horrible, even by... You know, some of the, the versions I've not been a big fan of. It's just, yeah. I mean, my favourite one is the Mario one. Mario one is, Mario one is great from what <laughs> oh, I've heard. The, that's the one with the powers and everything, isn't it? Yep. Again, changes the rules. There yeah. you go. I've... Mine, purely because it's what I grew up playing, was the Phantom Menace Monopoly. It had um, metal credits as money, which was very nice. Ooh, I mean, nice. my favourite Monopoly is Lords of Vegas. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's, that's the best answer so far. <laughs> uh, that, that, that is no. Played it relatively recently and I ran away with it. Made fast so good. It was good. <laughs> I've got so another good. question here from Campbell. Um, which would you rather you can play your favourite game every day, but it's the only game you ever get to play to the exclusion of all others, or you get to play a board game every day out of every board game in the world, but you'll get to play that given game only once for the rest of your life, and then all the copies of it worldwide get thrown into a big fire and you can never play it again? I don't answer that question. Um, uh, I, I... <laughs> basically basically <laughs> play, one, get, play one game forever, or play like lots of games only once play ever. Every oh. game only once ever. It's like I, I will, I will, as long as I get to choose the worst games that I don't like first, then they can go in a big fire and I'll be happy. I no, think see, I'm going to go for the second. I think the games just turn yeah. up and you don't get a choice. I think the games okay. just turn up. On I mean, as, as, and as, a, as a critic, in you know, in air quotes, I'd definitely go for the latter because that would give me a bit more taste, breadth of of, of interest. So okay. yeah, I, the, la- the latter for me. I'd go for the sec. I'd go for the latter as well. I think it'd be really interesting and kind of amazing just to be like. That is is really sad that I won't be able to play this game again. Like, you know, I'll never have the experience of playing... I'm looking at my shelves. Um, Twilight... I don't have Twilight Struggle. But Twilight Struggle. Uh, and I'll never play it again. If I played it wrong, tough. But then again, maybe that's the nature of art. And art by its very nature is ephemeral. I, I'm going to go with number two as well. Because of the wording of it. This is what I love. So I get to play any given game only once, and then all copies of it worldwide get thrown in a big fire. Yeah? Yeah. So a game can be doing really well. Everyone's loving it. Everyone's What's the new hot thing at the moment? What's Ark Nova. Ark cool. Nova. Cool. Everyone's talking about Ark Nova. Everyone's buying it. Everyone's playing it. And then I'm just like, well, no, I'm going to play it. And then you're never going to play it again. You could you could ransom people exactly I play your game. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, this is Sam Mag's ransom channel. I might play your oh game and then goodness, I'll disappear like, in a ball of fire. And then like all copies of it worldwide get made. Board. It's like listening to the Embracer boardroom at the moment. Oh, how can we make money out of this? You horrible, horrible it's, people. Trust, 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 the, trust these ones to, to hijack it. I was going for something pure and, and nah, lovely. Oh. No, I want the power. I, want I the have, power. I have a question. Because I am obviously a sure. person, that, person that interviews stuff. A lot of the new stuff that you see in other places, and I'm not going to say name any names, there's some people that do kind of like quite other stuff, but a lot of stuff seems to be kind of like, here's news and it's a press release and it's just marketing. How important was it you, when you were deciding the kind of the format of the podcast that you were going to be bringing in the more controversial stuff? And are you glad that you've continued to bring in these kind of talking points as the podcast has gone on. Ian, am I a quick... Okay, to jump in this very quickly. Yeah, go for it. Shoot, cool. shoot. Uh, um, I, I don't know if we actually like properly discussed it until we were a wee bit further down the line. Um, I'm just going, yeah, we're not really doing any press releases. And I think that was important because at that point, what is it? But it's a glorified ad for... Yeah for that and going oh this game is coming out and you can look at any board game websites you know there are screeds of them and going this game has been announced this game has been announced now yeah. to be fair we do do press releases when it's things like monopoly or like i think as i've said before <laughs> there are <laughs> that's so good now we don't do we don't do press releases because that's a big ad 
However, However we'll, we we'll talk about Monopoly. Come on, we'll, no, no. we'll take yeah, all the, the Monopoly bucks in the world. The literal no, no. embodiment of capitalism. <laughs> the, the, li- the literal embodiment of capitalism. Yeah, I, I've, of course, I, I contradict myself all the time. We do do Monopoly. No, but, but, uh, we do but, new but, but, press releases, yeah, for sure. We do new press releases, but it's mainly for stuff that I think we just said before, is stuff that is interesting, but not just for the product itself like i think yeah. recently we talked about the uh, monuments men playing cards which was art, uh playing cards with art that was still lost uh from uh, after the second world war or hidden by the nazis yes. uh i think that's quite interesting because it's talking about another yeah. it's something that's more important than just it's a pack of playing cards or there was a game uh i think last year that was on kickstarter and it was about preserving the mongolian language because the Mongolian language was in danger of being yeah. uh, ex- eradicated, yeah, and I, I I think that's that's important. I think that's important to to raise those kind of issues because it is not just here is a game; it is here is a game that is also maybe a learning tool or something like that. Yeah, I I have a distinct memory of I, the early casts. We were a little bit lighter, and there was some more skit stuff and that kind of thing. When when Sam was still part of the cast, we did some more of that kind of stuff, and that was that was good fun. And then there, I, I have a distinct memory of us all, of the three of us having a discussion about. I can't remember what it was. I'd have to go back and look at early cast. Yeah. But there was a, there was a thing happened in the ta- in the tabletop industry, and we sort of bit the bullet and decided to talk about it. And it was a controversial thing. And from that point on, I remember that. Yeah, we we, we dived more into that side of things because we weren't initially sure how to handle it because we were still quite young as a cast and. Let's face it, none of us really knew what we were doing. We were kind was, of sort of that wasn't in relation along. to... Was that not in relation potentially to people um, not doing their own homework? If I remember. Uh, I, don't, I honestly don't remember. It, it was quite an early cast. I think it was in, it was like in the er, late single or early double digits. All right, there was okay. something that like was a controversy. And we, we'd like... We hadn't really picked up on anything before then that was like really controversial, but there was a thing that happened. I I, I honestly don't remember what it was, but mm-hmm. I have a distinct memory of us us talking. I remember about, us like, talking how, about how, topics. How do we cover this? How 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 do we I remember us this? talking about like? Wasn't there like certain like like abuse stuff at conventions and things like yeah, that? Yeah, it was something yes. like that. Yeah, it was, um, something quite, it was something pretty pretty nasty. But yeah, I think it's also those things that clearly need to be spoken about. Right? Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. that's the whole point about speaking about it is like, well, yeah, you can go away and find a million casts about, you know, talking about the, the new edition of 40K that's just dropped. But it's like, well, it's not the most interesting thing. Right. And I remember having those conversations like yeah. if it's just another thing where, you know, you can go to the front page of whatever uh, whatever it might be and read out all of those headlines of just here's the cool stuff that's being released in shops this week it's yeah. like well that's just what everyone else is doing right in um, that case in that yeah. case do you, do you feel that you've maintained your integrity as a podcast because i don't think you know it's not a case of you know uh it's like oh what are you what are you leaning on well i'm leaning on this uh, rather big copy of arc nova that i've got on my side oh that looks fun. Well, it is. Let me tell you why it's fun kind of thing. So do you feel kind of kind of almost like, well, we're glad we kind of maintained our integrity because you don't seem to be beholden to anybody. But also at the same time, does that put you in a does that put you in a difficult situation if, say, somebody approached to sponsor the podcast then? Would you I just think Ian's person, for? Ian's person, just talked to about sponsorship, definitely. Um, yeah, but I, I think the way I'm, I've kind of approached it. And I think I've said this to Ian. I may have said this to Sam. I can't remember when we were talking about it. But going, we are in a rapidly burgeoning and has been for maybe twenty five years or so uh, industry that's that's huge now. There are so many podcasts when you can talk about these are the games I've been playing and mm. why we like these games and that's that's fine I've got no problem with them you know they are yeah. fantastic they, they do their great they do their own thing podcasting very easy good podcasting very hard I'm not saying we're good podcasters we're doing okay but <laughs> but we we don't I'm not I'm not I don't I don't want to sit here I don't I, I think it would be disingenuous to say sit in a podcast and go, oh, yeah, the board game community, oh, we're so wonderful, we're so open and inclusive and welcoming. As, you know, you hear that a lot of people say that, which in many ways is true, but also it's a massive lie. We talked about what some of that, you know, on the record tonight. Mm, There's yeah. a lot of way to go. And I don't think 
that it's going to get better by not talking about it. No, and like I think we, we, we have we have to bring these things to light, as ugly as they may be, as you know, people who reputations, you know, it, maybe that we don't have a good reputation because we do just you know keep going. We'll talk about this stuff. I, think, I, part of me really doesn't why, care because it needs to get talked about. Do you think that's why when something kind of hits? like this most recent thing that we were discussing tonight, it's almost like you get the feeling like everybody sharpens their pitchforks and goes out because genuinely, unless something's being highlighted, you know, there are people that do champion the inclusivity, but I sometimes get the feeling that some some people are quite, ha- you know, they just get on with it. I'm, I'm creating my next bit of content. I'm, you know, I'm writing my next review. I'm playing my next game. And then when people say, oh, look, this person's been, you know, a terrible person, it's like, all right, well, let's light up the torches and go up to the castle kind of thing. Um, I, I, yeah, it's, it's a really hard one because I definitely think things like Twitter amplify the, the emotions because yes. you're seeing all this stuff over and over and over again. And of course it yeah. gets you angry. I mean, I, I've read, I, I read a lot. One, one of the things we do on the cast is read a lot of the stuff so you don't have to. Because there's some stuff in the in the stories we've covered in the past, and there's one a couple of casts ago where we were covering I can't remember the gentleman's name, but basically a a guy who was incredibly anti-Semitic and racist. And I went and looked at some of his tweets and encouraged everyone not to, because I had. But mm. basically that's one of the things we do is we read into this stuff and like look it up and actually read about it so we can present it and summarize it for you so you don't have to go and look for these things. And it's very easy. I think it's very easy for like twitter to seem black like twitter is the main one let's face it yes. for like this kind of stuff yeah. for like everything to seem black and white and there are definitely gray areas but at the same time there are things that absolutely need called out and i think one of the advantages we have as a cast is we are, have always been you know extremely aware that we are well for a while three white cis het men and now two white cis het men <laughs> recovering the news and that there's a bit of privilege with that, of course, because of the way our society is set up. Mm-hmm. But it also means that we have a bit of protection yeah, from I mean, calling this stuff yeah. out. We can yeah, we can if say comes after you. Then I mean, there's less likely. Eh? Yeah, exactly. It's less likely. Like if we if we were women or people of color covering this stuff, I would imagine the backlash to us covering this stuff would be much much worse. Yeah. And that's awful. But it, it's good that we can like stand and say these things and like try and be allies and try and point out the horrible things that are going on on mm. in the world in our particular hobby, and it it does upsets the wrong word, but it does it, it irritates me slightly that like larger places like for instance Lice Tower News that kind of thing they occasionally cover some of the stuff we cover, but it's mostly press releases for most of the big new most of the big news sites. It's most. It's just all press releases, and everything is awesome. And our board game's wonderful. And I wrote a piece about this recently, about the nature of content creation. If you just want to be in promotion, that's fantastic and great, and we need those people. But we also need the criticism side as well. Yeah. If we're going, if we're going to grow as a hobby, if we're going to be actually be more inclusive and not just say it. Yeah. You need someone going. Oh, this guy's. A- the, 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 this paper's not good or that's not great or you need yeah. people pointing that stuff out and when we when we first set up the cast the like the the cast that will never be heard i'm not even sure i've got that original cast for those that don't know we put out to our friends and family basically before we ever did brainwaves jamie sam and i put together a single cast for the kind of thing we might the brainwaves might look like a sort of i'll likely experience. have it somewhere yeah, yeah. It, Sam's maybe got some. I maybe maybe got a copy somewhere. And basically, the original idea behind the cast was to do a more sort of day to day, sort of satirical news show, the Mash Report, the Mash Report, that kind of thing. Yeah, right. I, and, I, I just realised you've been like I know we've done a bunch of interviews together, and you've said you know the day to day, and I'm like I get that, but I realised Mash that Report is actually a better cool. comparison. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right, but yeah, that that sort of thing, right? Or the, or the Bugle, or, or or those kind of satirical news shows. And we gave that to a shot. It, to say it went badly. <laughs> the, the feedback was like, basically, it was like we didn't sound like ourselves. I didn't sound like, you know, it, 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 our personalities didn't come through because we were trying so hard to do the other thing, to, to do the satirical side of that. Because mm. it, it turns out comedy is hard. Yeah, it's comedy hard. is new. And, um, that, and then, that, yeah. that's why we started doing those like little... 
sketches as well, wasn't it? Because it was like, yeah. let's stray away from that. Let's keep it. Let's do like the, the serious news stuff, but also if there's like a little weird world we can then dive into and do some... And it was basically just like a realistic look on what a board game is and like just extrapolating that out, wasn't it? So like we did yeah, like totally. Fog of Love and we did um, like Deep Sea Adventure where Adventure. we're all going down and... Well, that was um, good, yeah, I remember that. On one. a submarine and stuff. No, there, there was one. There was one I recorded outside. We did a skit for five minute chase. And yes, I recorded part of it outside, actually running with my wife. <laughs> Which I don't know if that photo is still there, but if you look on the Giant Brain that's, website yeah, and there's a photo that, of all of us, Ian, I think the, the, the picture of still. Ian is the photo that he took while he was recording it's, this. Not while, but just like, yeah, absolutely it, it's amazing. Great. It's the best photo. It's the first photo I ever thought I saw of Ian and I went, oh, <laughs> somebody's been exercising. And, and if you look at, I, I, and if you look on the site, Jamie's got this, you know, lovely headshot. Yeah. And Sam has this like, you know, album coming this year kind of headshot. <laughs> <laughs> That's from like 10 years ago. Yeah, but, mine, was, yeah. mine was from five years ago. <laughs> He, so, like, like no, he, he, Ian Chandler's photo is a little bit more iPhone fuzzy, but even like even Peter Hopkins, who's written for us a couple of times, his photo looks all like sort of black and white, so and like nice. here's the, here, the author book jacket kind of photo, and I'm just like a sweaty guy with some branches coming out of my head. <laughs> Brilliant. So I'm Genius. conscious of the time, so I'm going to go to one last. Yeah, question we should probably wrap things up. From Gavin, Gavin the Body Jones. <laughs> Any stories you're especially proud of the way that you handled them? Can I do, can I start purely because I've been around yeah, for the sure, least amount of, of time, I suppose? Yeah, of course you can, yeah. Um, so the one that comes back to me, and again, it's going back to like the integrity question and stuff, and I get that this is mm -hmm. like this question's been asked as like a follow-up. But I'm sure Ian and Jamie remember us talking about like the dies app. Yeah. Yes. Um and again, just going back to that idea of being able to say things because we're not beholden to any, like, you know, sponsorship or anything like that. We don't have to have this, like, isn't everything wonderful kind of take. There was this app that was on Kickstarter and it wasn't on Kickstarter. And it kind of, the idea of it was it's going to teach you how to play a bunch of board games. And we had, like, a serious dive into it. We, um, Ian, you learned how to play King Domino through the app to really yeah. kind of give it a test run. And overall, it was good. And we had good things to kind of say about it. We were like, yeah, this could go somewhere. And we interviewed some people from the company and there was some weird stuff around it as well because they like went up on Kickstarter and they, and they did they like, it was like Indiegogo. They had a yeah, load of money from it. And then they went to Kickstarter Indiegogo for Indiegogo. extra funding. And it was all a bit odd. And I think the way we kind of went about the whole thing was just like, we're just going to give our take on it. And our take will sometimes be really good on it. Our take will sometimes be, what the hell's going on here? Yeah. Um, and But I suppose it was just, good fun to be able to have all of those opinions and put them all out whilst actually, you know, using it and enjoying some of it, but then having direct interviews with people who are making the app as well. Um, yeah. But then after the interviews, kind of coming away and saying, well, we're still not entirely sure about it. We don't know, but we'll keep you updated. And yeah, like no glossing over anything, really. It was like, here's our honest yeah. take. We don't know. And we're also saying this in an interview with the guy who's making it. Um, yeah, so yeah. That's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. What about you, that. Ian? What about you, Ian? Was there, is it the same, the, the dice thing, or would there, I mean, there must have been hundreds of stories. Yeah, we did handle that well. And yeah, look, look, we've had 100 casts and we've covered a lot of, like, let's face it, we've covered a lot of pretty horrible stuff within the industry. Yep. Uh, we've covered a lot of abuse cases and we've reached out to individuals and, and and talked to them about whether it's okay to use their stories and that kind of thing even though the stuff's on twitter we when we can and when i have the time because i don't always i do reach out to people who are like reporting abuse and that kind of thing to say look we'd like to talk about this in our cast is that okay hmm. uh, we we do our best to be as honest as we can we do our best to like like one one of the things that the relationship Jamie and I have especially is like Jamie keeps me in check when I want to go off on one a bit more and like mm. keeps me in line, which mm. is which is great. I love him for that. It like keep keeps me sort of like centered as opposed to otherwise this cast would just me be ranting at people a lot. <laughs> it would be, but uh, yeah, I I, th I think we're we're quite measured in the way the, the format we have now is we're quite measured in the way we present articles like the 
the Jameson and his team one we covered in this particular cast. Hmm. And then we get a little bit of a chance to go off on one a little bit and discuss what our own thoughts are on it. And I like, I really like that separation that we've reached in the cast where there's a little bit of our own personality in there and like what we think about the thing, but we're also presenting the facts as they are presented to the world through Twitter or Facebook posts or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. There's a, there's a good delineation between here are the facts of the situation. Here's what the current members of the cast think about that situation. I think we've reached a really nice balance of that over the last, of the last sort of, year year or two of of the cast oh good good and finally um jamie i mean i think both uh ian and sam have made some excellent um examples i mean i that's very kind of what uh for you to say that about me Ian. um i mean i feel like you i feel like you do the exact same for me (laughs) uh uh, yeah, you know, it, it sounds stupid, but I, I, I completely agree because there are times I will go off on maybe, not, maybe sometimes not people. You know, maybe I am slightly more of a backseat at times. As I, I joke about just making lots of sarcastic comments, and sometimes that's true, and sometimes I'm just, sometimes I'm just like I, I don't know what to say to this. I yeah. think one one thing that immediately sticks in my head. I don't but proud of the way, but I think it was just it was an interesting challenge. Let's put it that way. Was I think it was. I think it was last year and it was three very very hard news stories straight away which was um, somebody who was doing a Kickstarter preview for a game and was uh, dressed in a racist fashion for oh, God, uh, yeah. an East Asian person yeah. then it was uh, then I believe it was Phil Eklund the creator of Pax Premier. No, it wasn't Pax Premier. It was creator of a number of games. I'm afraid I can't remember the names of his games right now because, to be honest, I don't give the man the oxygen of publicity, let alone the oxygen of oxygen. That's not nice. I just don't think about him. Uh, and there was also <laughs> Daniel Tashini. Yeah. And it was three of them. And I don't remember if Jeff Bergen was in that episode as well. I but don't there think was. So, but there were two or three casts in a row where we covered that stuff. Yeah. And. Quite a bit. And. I don't want to say proud, but it was just us all sitting beforehand going, right. I think this is when Ian Chandler was there as well and going, yeah. right, how are we going to do this? We'll split us up into three and we'll take it. And the fact we were going, we are giving you the fact. We're not going to color this and go, this person has been a right prick. No, that's that's coloring it. And that's that's bias. Give the exact give the facts as we have seen them, as they're reporting as truthfully as we can. And there's nothing you can there's nothing to say that'll add to that because if you try and start offering opinions on it sometimes it just feels like you're trying to gild the lily you don't you don't need to say anything just let that let their actions and what they've said and what they've done speak for themselves that's quite quite wonderful and very very and very very well put um i think it's time to draw things to a close gentlemen um I'd obviously I'd like to thank um I'd like to thank Ian and and Jamie for for uh, for asking me along. I don't know if Sam did. I'm pretty sure he did by proxy as well. So it's been a delight <laughs> to be here. It's um, been it's been lovely to have you along Richard. Thanks very much for for coming along and helping us out with this one. That's brilliant. Now, if you are listening along tonight and you like what you have listened and there's a couple of ways that you can actually help the Giant Brain podcast and the best thing to do is to share the podcast, tell other people about it, shout it from the rooftops, hand out self crayon leaflets to people in the post office as you're meeting them, as you're posting board games to other people out there. You can also drop us a review and you can also rate them in, on iTunes. Now, it's very, very important that you do not give these people... Um, do not give these people one star because you will break their hearts And but do not give them ten stars on iTunes because that will make them big headed give them something in the middle like a five because it's average and they are a little bit average but you can yeah, also um, join them there, in Discord also, as well there is also one be... person there is a one photo of me with I have an it looks like I have an absolutely massive head <laughs> I don't it just seems like I have a massive head 
He does, folks, in real life. Massive head. <laughs> it's brilliant. So you can join them on the Discord, which I'm not, the links will be in the show notes. You can go to Twitter, which is twitter.com forward slash this giant brain. You can join them on Instagram, which is giant brain UK. You can join them on Facebook, which is facebook.com forward slash the giant brain. Go to the website, which is giantbrain.co.uk, or if you want to email them about news, views, or Huey Lewis in the news, then you can email them on giantbrainuk at gmail.com. There's only one more thing to do. It's a goodbye from Sam. Say goodbye, Sam. Goodbye. Thank you very it's much a- for coming along, Sam. It's been lovely. <laughs> no, thank you very much. I'm gonna I'm gonna sneak back off into the walls. Yeah. yeah. Oh. And I'm gonna watch you playing games. I'll I'm be there. Now. It's a goodbye. I'll be there. Jamie, say goodbye. I'm always there. Goodbye, Jamie. It's a goodbye from Ian. Say goodbye, Ian. Goodbye, Ian. And it's a goodbye from me. Remember, stay safe, roll sixes, and keep your eyes on the giant brain as it keeps its eye on the news for you. But until the next time, goodbye. Bye. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye.